my name is Alan Martinez, and this is EJ. And really, we're going to talk about the toys. Now, it's funny, the Admiral actually talked about the toys, and uh, we're going to talk about them too, but we're going to talk about them in a different way. And, uh, and then, obviously, our presentation is about training the task and not the, not the toy. Okay. Let's start by uh, going into some of the different simulation simulators and the different uh, aviation training devices that we have at ATC Mobile. Uh, the first is the aviation training devices. Uh, here you can see uh, instructor pilots working at a uh, desktop trainer. Uh, here they're using specifically, uh, they're specifically learning how to use the multi-function displays or the MFDs uh, that you see on the computer screen. And you're about to see him in a sec. He's using his book, and he's going to the uh, cockpit uh, 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 display unit. Thank you. Or the CDU. Uh, and essentially, they're learning how to use these systems uh, alone from any other aspect of the aircraft. And basically, this is scaffolding their knowledge, uh, preparing them to be able to full, be fully immersed in the simulator. This is the Reconfigurable Cockpit Procedures Trainer, or the RCPT. And this simulator, essentially, uh, uh, is the, the main advantage of this simulator is the fact that you can actually go and touch the screen. All of the screens are touch screen. Uh, you're able to, uh, uh, if, I, if I wanted to manipulate a device, and I want to actually push one of these, one, one of these screens, the switch would flip, uh, even though it's only a digital representation of that switch. Uh, so the advantage of this is that it's not configurable. I, I could have one aircraft in it one day and then switch the soft, uh, load up a different set, and all of a sudden I'll have another aircraft in it. So I could get a whole bunch of different people through that, through that simulator. The next one is the MHCPT Copy Procedures Trainer, or the CPT. And here, you, again, you'll see uh, it is a full simulator, but the focus here is on providing the tactile feel for the, the pilots. They're able to actually manipulate all of those switches uh, uh, in the cockpit directly. Uh, and they still have the, the very high visuals, but notice that there is no motion in either R, but the RCPT or the, the CPT, the Cockpit Procedures Trainer. Uh, now, whenever we get to the operational flight trainers, it becomes a whole other level. You have not only outstanding visuals and outstanding the tactile having the sorry the the high functional fidelity, and uh, you also have motion. Uh, and so the simulator is up on stilts here. You'll be able to it'll move around uh, through all the stick and rudder commands here. Technically, this is uh, the admiral mentioned this today. Uh, if this is brand new, and technically it's not an operational flight trainer, it's an air crew weapons trainer. Uh, the Admiral talked about how he was able to snipe uh, uh, at, at different targets today and how that is quite enjoyable. It is an amazing experience. Uh, but again, uh, high quality visuals, uh, very good acoustics, and outstanding uh, motion. You're, you're, you'll feel the helicopter move uh, 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 as, as, you're in, as you're in there. And then uh, you also have the M865DOFT. Uh, this is set up on a, uh, it, it's not up on stilts, where the pilots sit actually is set up on a platform inside of it, uh, and, it, and the, the platform is providing uh, the simulation of acceleration motion. Uh, and basically, uh, in, in there, the, uh, uh, you're, <clears throat> sorry, uh, basically in there, you're able to uh, have a high fidelity environment that has acoustics, motion, and uh, 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 the visuals in there, all simulated for a fraction of the price uh, of, of previous ones. Uh, that particular simulator will be online this November at ATC Mobile. Uh, now, these are multi-million dollar systems, and they're very complicated systems. How do you interface with these systems? Well, here you see a fold-out that, uh, that, we, that we made, that on the left-hand side is the, uh, basically you would see this on, uh, uh, two display, two monitors, uh, and on the left monitor you would see the iOS main page, and here you have all these different functions, and you're able to insert malfunctions, you're able to uh, manipulate the weather, 
Uh, you're able on the right hand side to, in, uh, to insert targets. If I wanted to, I can insert a, a oil rig, set it on fire, put flares coming out of it, uh, do all sorts of amazing things with this. But these, if this looks complicated, uh, this is just scratching the surface. These, uh, throughout here, you can see, this is just the first page here. All the way down here, you have more pages, you have more tabs here, you have all sorts of different layers and different kinds of, uh, uh, of malfunctions. Uh, and then here you also have all sorts of different layers, and uh, it becomes very complicated. And especially if you look at how all the different uh, instructors are expected to perform these across different platforms, uh, uh, in, in the case of the 60 community, they're expected to learn the 60, T, the 60 CPT, the, the cockpit procedures training, and they're expected to learn the operational flight training, and the IOS stations are a little bit different in each one, it becomes a very complicated process. And here you see the different, uh, 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 here you're able to get the different runways, uh, and each runway that's in the, the gaming area can be, you can decide which runway you're going to, maybe you can turn the runway lights on and off, uh, there's different things that you have to remember to do. And all of the different simulators, the point of this uh, video here is to show that all the different simulators have this iOS, and it's a very complicated system. So. Okay, we're, just, we're building a story at this point. Uh, uh, you can obviously, that those are the toys, and you'll see a few more in a second. And really, I want to address real quickly from an instructional standpoint how we apply the toys to the training. Uh, and if you're an instructional designer or familiar with learning, obviously Bloom's uh, three domains of learning. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you how the cognitive do domain, how our how our training, our, our syllabi fits fits the cognitive uh, progression. Uh, when the person shows up to learn how to fly, uh, they're doing the ground school, they're learning EPs, emergency procedures, they're learning aircraft systems. That's really down at the rote level, uh, understanding application level, um, and we have. Uh, classroom lecture, we have uh, self-study workbooks and stuff like that. But where we use the toys, really, you go to the next slide, is really up at the, at the higher cognitive level. And that's where we're using the aviation training devices, the operational flight trainer, and even the aircraft. And you can see up, up there at the top three, uh, some others would call that the correlation level. That's where all that's happening, and that's the higher order thinking skills that we're trying to teach. So that's how we use the training or use those toys to end the instructional systems at ATC Mobile. Now, when we talk about simulators or OFTs, we'll talk about OFTs, operational flight trainers, um, the FAA, they, they actually have uh, levels of fidelity. And we, and our, the ones we have that uh, Captain Main has down at ATC Mobile is really at the CMD level. And that really speaks to the fidelity of the equipment. Now, the reason the FAA has these levels is because a lot of the aviation training nowadays is done in simulators, and you actually have to have the, the simulator qualified or certified to do the training. So the FAA, it's really about the fidelity of the equipment, and that's where these uh, levels come from, and it's really so you can train in them, train in them, and test in them, and do check flights. It's really about the fidelity of the equipment, and that's what this uh, levels of fidelity or the FAA levels. Now, in the past, what we did in order to uh, facilitate pilot training is basically you'd get the pilot would come in and uh, uh, in order to operate the simulator, the pilot would come in and he'd say, uh, uh, I'm here to learn about how to be an instructor pilot. And they would say, well, come on. And they'd, they'd go into the simulator and here again is this complicated, very complicated, multi-million dollar piece of equipment that's probably foreign to them other than the experience of using it. Uh, they probably never thought about actually putting it on motion and actually sitting behind the instructor operating station before. And they, the, the instructor pilot, the fully qualified instructor pilot, sits at the instructor operating station. It's so hard not to say the IP sits at the IOS. Uh, but the fully qualified instructor pilot sits behind the instructor operating station and he's sitting there looking at the, the iOS. His focus is on the two students up front. And his focus is on making sure that those guys are, are, are ready to go to be, uh, to be pilots. And he's gonna give them the best uh, simulated environment he possibly can. 
his focus is not on teaching the guy behind him who's in the observer seat kind of looking over his shoulder and every once in a while you'll see the instructor pilot that's sitting at the, uh, the instructor operating station say, hey, uh, I'm going to manipulate the ceiling here and put it down to 10,000 feet. You see how I did that? All right, thanks. And meanwhile, the, the, the simulator's moving back and forth. And what's the instructor pilot? The, the instructor under training, the guy that's learning to be the instructor pilot, what's he going to say? Oh, yeah, roger that. I got it. Uh, so there is a, a severe lack of knowledge that the this, that this shadow and pause. And so what other method would you use here to, to, to get this? Uh, you would get, uh, not only would you get that shadowing experience, but imagine that you're an instructor pilot, and you just had, that was your background knowledge, and you're given this, uh, this manual, and you're saying, hey, go ahead and open it up, uh, flip through this, and hopefully next week you'll be a fully competent, you'll know how to operate all the different pieces of this thing later, and you'll be ready to go. But by the way, not one part of it teaches you, like, as an instructor pilot, you want to focus on teaching your students how to run, uh, how, how to make an approach to water, how to, do different, how to do different tasks that you're expecting of your pilots. Uh, now, the, the instructor pilot, there's an instructor under training who looks at this and is, has all these other duties and responsibilities, is going to be overwhelmed and leave that, that, that shadow of experience and the experience of leading this, uh, this IUH, the Instructor Utilization Handbook with an unclear picture. So what happened is we, we were invited to work on instructor pilot training. And what we found is all the instructor pilot training, sorry Larry, I didn't mean to be in your way there. All the instructor pilot training was really focused on the toy. Now, I know for myself and probably most aviators in this room, the toy is really cool. And everybody wants to get in the toy and everybody wants to fly the toy. But we realize that the, the training, the instructor pilot training, is not about the toy. And so we had to step back and say, okay, if we're going to improve instructor pilot training, what HPT uh, principles are we going to apply to that to actually make it true training that prepares the instructor what they need to do or what they need, uh, what they need to know and be able to do? I'll give you another uh, story of a of a 60 pilot uh, who used to be stationed at DC Mobile. In the previous training, <clears throat> he showed up, he did the shadowing, um, and I know some of you as instructor pilots have lived the shadowing thing. Uh, so he has his first event, all right? He has it, he's the first time with his students. So he goes in there, gets in the, you know, it's 20 million, 25 million dollar simulator, you know, and starts running the event, and he can't get it up on motion. So he runs this whole event, this is his first event, you know, and he's got probably some senior level uh, pilots up front, and he's, he's new and he's sweating, and he's, so he's trying to run the simulator and create the simulated environment and everything like that, but he can't get it up on motion. Why can't he get up on motion? Because he never learned that you have to close the door for the motion to, 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 uh, to activate the safety interlock switches. And that was never clear to him in the shadowing training Close the damn door so it'll blow up on motion. So do you see how we have this problem? We were, we were trying to teach by handing them the instructor utilization handbook, which in, in fact comes from the contractor when we, when, we buy, when we bought the 144 and when we bought these others. We get this document and they hand it to us and the pilot and, and you guys that have been down there, you might have seen it, might not have seen it. So that was the, really the dilemma. It was focused on the toy and not the task. So, this is what we did, and this is, this is, Todd, this is the HPT part, alright? <laughs> Todd had to decide whether to come to 101 or this one, and I, I told him to come here because it's really more applicable to his job, but this is the HPT part. So what we did was, we stepped back, and as you know, if you're an hpt or an isd -er, it's about what they need to know and be able to do. And what they really need to be able to do is create the simulated environment. You understand? It's not about running the closing the door or running the sim or conducting the uh, instructor operating system. It's about creating the simulated environment, and that so that's the approach we went. And so instead of looking at the equipment fidelity, we actually started with the OFT fidelity, where it was beyond just the equipment. And then this is we we did some research, um, found some some doctors that were smarter than us and 
read what they were talking about and kind of said, okay, where do we need to look at this? How do we apply that? And we really saw that there was four main fidelity areas, and one more that we'll talk about in a second, that really described the, a, the UFT fidelity. Uh, first of all, whenever we talk about fidelity, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, basically imagine that you've got a person playing a, a, playing a violin, and uh, you could hear the sound of that, you could, you could hear how the high quality of that, that sound coming, coming your way. Uh, it's actually a person playing a violin in front of you. Next to that, you have a stereo, and on it it says high five. Well, that high five means high fidelity. And the higher the fidelity of that stereo, the, the, the closer it's going to sound like the person playing the violin. Uh, so there's, uh, and that would be a very, that would be a perfect description of physical fidelity. Uh, is, is what this is designed to do, does it look and feel, and does it, does it look and feel just like the, the real deal? So in, in a simulator, in a cockpit, does the simulator look and feel like the actual cockpit? Uh, functional fidelity, do the devices in the cockpit, do they operate in the same way that the, 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 the devices in the aircraft would uh, actually operate? Uh, and then psychological fidelity, I call that the suspension of disbelief. Uh, do they feel like they're, that, like that they're in the actual simulator? And then the task fidelity, does, this, does the different function uh, of the pilot, is the pilot able to function uh, in, in the simulator in the same way that they would in, in the aircraft? And then the, the, all of this, though, uh, is kind of put under the umbrella of the next uh, kind of fidelity, which is operational fidelity. Okay, how many of you here think if you have a higher fidelity in the simulator or the uh, operational flight trainer that training, the transfer of learning or training will be better? What do you think? Depends. It depends. Depends? Who said that? I say that. Depends on what you're trying to teach. If you're talking about the, the synthesized performance, yes. If you want someone, like you had them on the desk working with just one piece of it, too much fidelity, putting them in a whole cockpit might take away from Exactly. What, what we're finding, and if you, if you do the research, what we're finding is actually sometimes the fidelity gets in the way. And you actually need a lower fidelity because it's about, hey buddy, how's it going? Um, it's about the learning. It's about the transfer of learning, not just the realism of the, of the, of the instrument. And what we found is, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But who is it focused, how do we determine that? Who is it focused on? Who is it focused on when we're, when we're, we're training? Okay, and it's not about the equipment, it's focused on who? The learner, exactly. So you gotta look at the learner, not the, not the equipment, and that tells you what the fidelity needs to be. So, so we found Mr. Thomas here, he's down on the other side of the world, down in Australia, and uh, he, can, he coined this term, uh, this term, operational fidelity. Now, he used it in a, in a CRM, crew resource management, there's a program called LOSA, uh, Safety, audit where they actually go out and threat errors and management stuff like that. And he was saying, hey, if we can just roll that back into the training. He turned that as operational fidelity. We uh, decided that we were going to use this term to really coin the phrase or try to attempt to explain what we were after as far as the learner. And it really is, what does the pilot need to know or what the instructor need to know to create the simulated environment. And it is technical, non-technical, and you'll see this in a second. And it really is about creating the simulated environment, not operating the, the uh, toy. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk, talk about more of our research that we did. We looked at the paper called It's Not How Much You Have, But How You Use It Toward a Rational Use of Simulation to Support Aviation Training. And it's written by uh, Mr. S Dr. Salas there. And in this, um, and in this article, there was a particular quote that I felt really uh, drove the point home that we're trying to make. Uh, please allow me to read it. In essence, aviation training has not evolved, but simulated simulations and simulators have. In other words, simulation is being used without consideration of what has been learned about individual and team training and cognition. And then, so to achieve the goal of promoting learning, to achieve the goal of promoting learning, there will need to be a shift in focus from the designing of simulation for realism and just hoping that learning occurs. 
to the design of human-centered training systems to support the acquisition of complex skills. So a, a shift needs to be made, and a shift is being made in the simulator community uh, uh, from the, the toy to, to the task. Uh, and we have to consider the complex environments that, uh, that, that the pilots are expected to perform in uh, when designing instruction for them. Okay, so any questions so far? So obviously it's about the task, right? Not the toy. All right, so then what we did was, because it's about the task, we, we looked at that and we said, okay, it's about the cognitive and behavior requirements, uh, the learning environment, and it's really tied to the higher order. Now, it gets a little confusing sometimes because we worked on instructor pilot training, which is teaching instructors to be instructors, but they're teaching students, and where's the learning and that whole, you know, we call it IUT, and it gets a little confusing sometimes. But the key was in instructor pilot training, create the simulated environment that promotes this higher order thinking skills, not only for the student, but it's helping with the higher order thinking skills for the instructor. So what we did is we went and we looked at it, and, and we first started with the 65, and we said, okay, we need to refresh and we need to fix the training. And so we went and uh, started doing that. And we looked at the tasks, the task that the instructor pilot needs to be able to do, which is now the focus of the, uh, of the training. All right. What we realized is it's beyond the handbook. It's beyond the equipment manual. It's, it's, it's beyond the operating procedures. And it's beyond, as you heard EJ talk about the shadowing, we call it tribal knowledge. It's beyond that. It's, it's what, is, what does Rob Potter need to do? And he went through the training some. I, I think he went through the earlier version. What does he need to know and be able to do to provide the simulated environment? That was the question. And what would happen, again, is uh, uh, in regards to the tribal knowledge, you would have a group of people, you know, the, the, you would have the simulator experts say, hey, come on over to this briefing. And everybody would come to the briefing. And the, the, the branch would come to the briefing and listen to what the simulator experts had to say. But after that initial briefing, then whenever new people came on board, the, the, the instructor pilots would say, hey, come along with us. And there was a, there was a general de degradation of knowledge from that point on. And so that's that's uh, uh, so there. Are, uh, whenever we actually took the time to, to look at what the instructor pilot performed and what the instructor pilot did, we identified six uh, high level tasks that, uh, that that generally focused across the board what they had to do in order to use that simulator to facilitate a simulated environment. And these were the tasks: conduct a student briefing. Determine the operational status of the trainer, perform training reporting procedures, prepare the trainer for the training session, conduct a flight training session from the iOS, and terminate a training session. And so essentially you take them through the whole process from you take them through the whole process from start to finish. Uh, and these six tasks, does it mention which aircraft that, that you're that you're working with? Well no, it doesn't. I could take these six tasks and apply it to any operational flight training and from from I go from there. Let's go ahead and focus on the fifth task, conduct a flight training session from the IOS. Now, in this task, uh, it starts with determining exactly what your objectives are. Uh, and here you have your terminal performance object objective, and it says conduct a flight training session in accordance with the syllabus and provided references. And then it has all of your enabling objectives that support that. These form the core of the, of the instruction uh, for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the instructor pilot. Uh, assuming the instructors on the train. <clears throat> what we did then was we broke down that first enabling objective into a step, uh, manage current conditions for own ship. And then there were sub-steps that went along with that. Now some, the point of this slide is to show that some of the tasks were absolutely, you know, right out of the instructor utilization handbook. It shows, okay, this tells you exactly what to do, and we were able to use the instructor utilization handbook as a reference for that. But then other parts of the task, uh, such as conduct a ground controlled approach, such as a BAR or SAR, uh, you, you, are, you are not able to go ahead and just, you, there was no part of the instructor utilization handbook that you were able to use in order to get that, that skill. And if you wanted your students to do that, you would have to read the book and translate it in your head and try to figure out exactly <coughs> what you wanted your, your, your students to do and how to use the simulator to do that. Here we facilitated that so that they could facilitate uh, the simulated environment. All right, and I'll give you an example of the ground control approach. 
in the instructor operating station, there actually is buttons and things that you look at as you're doing a ground control approach. However, they're non-equipment things, i.e. role-playing air traffic control, that has nothing to do with the equipment. It, you're acting like the controller. Now, what we found, this is interesting, pilots don't make good controllers. <laughs> they really don't, because they, they talk like pilots instead of controllers. So they get in there and they freaking wing it, they wing it, and, uh, sorry, <laughs> like we do a lot of times, and, uh, sorry about that, and we found that we had to give them those skills to role play an ATC mobile instructor. Now, I know Rob, he's probably the best controller in there now, right? <laughs> Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> so what we found out is we had to give them training on being a controller, which they did. So we had to go find the references, read this before we do that, practice this. So do you see that's the non-equipment task, and those are the higher level tasks that we're talking about. Now, uh, in, the, in the intervention that we gave them, in the uh, instruction that we built for them, this is a fold out from that. Now the point of this is that there is a system called, in the simulator, called the, transit, uh, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System, or TCAS. And it's an actual system that's on the aircraft and that the simulator attempts to simulate. Uh, and basically, whenever I talk to all these different instructor pilots across different, uh, especially in the 60 community, no, no offense, uh, uh, everybody said that the TCAS system is useless and it's a waste of time. Uh, I don't use it in the simulator. We don't. We don't use it in the simulator. Period. In a blind. Uh, and I said, really? Well, why? Why is that? And then I heard about that uh, in my my research. I heard about the ASAP about you know the importance of collision avoidance. And I said, man, if we could use this, this is a big deal. I know it'll enhance our ASAP goals. Uh, I've got the ASAP standards. Aviation. Okay. 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 Safety. 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 All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but basically, we took that TCAS, the, the, the tra Traffic Collision Avoided System, and we made it simple. We put it on one big page that, fold, fold, that folds out from, from the book, and it explains very clearly in three simple steps what they need to do. And basically, the book, the, the Instructor Utilization Handbook, showed how to use those buttons and what those buttons did. But nobody was actually taking the time to read that and in detail and see how that applied directly to their job, how that how they wanted to be able to simulate simulate a, a high traffic environment for their pilots. The, that term that I just used, simulate a high traffic environment for, the, for your students, did not appear in, in the instructor handbook. And, and, yeah. So that was one of the non-equipment tasks. We, in that case, you can see how the equipment tied to the higher task of creating the simulator for the high traffic environment. All right, let's talk quickly about just how we designed it. Um, uh, just the latest amount on IUT, instructor under training, that's what they call it in the 65 branch. OFT is what they call it in the 60 branch. You know, we wanted to, uh, you know, throw them too many curveballs, so we kind of used those names. But really, what we did is, it's the same thing for both aircraft, because the tasks are the same. It only gets different when you get down to the specific one, maybe equipment or some different thing or a different maneuver. <coughs> And what we found is the best way to design it is get rid of the shadowing thing. The shadowing thing doesn't work. And what we added was this first event, this OFT operations right here. What that is, is the instructor actually, he has a reading assignment, he reads the manual, he reads all this other stuff, reads how to be a controller, all that stuff like that. And he actually goes with the, an instructor. So we'll call it the IUT, goes with an instructor, and it's just them. It's just them, and it's and it's like a one hour, whatever it needs to. We assess performance, and they go through all the stuff to run the machine, all the stuff. But it's no, there's no students involved. There's no pilot, student pilots. It's just it's just them and the instructor, and we assess and we make sure there's practical exercises. We found that adding that piece made all the difference in the world because now they get all the tasks and everything. Once we went from there, we rolled into um, the uh, scenarios that we commonly do in the in the simulator with proficiency courses, and what happens, what the way we design that is, now the instructor goes in with the IUT. The real instructor goes in with the student instructor, and their students, the student instructor sits at the iOS, 
the instructor runs the event, and the, and the student instructor is in there watching that, and, and they take turns and practice and stuff like that. And it was really the practical application of, of the first one. And they go through that, and they do three different ones, and as they go through it, they're learning, and, and, and they take more of the simulator, or some more of the events. And then we got down, and finally what we realized is we weren't doing any kind of check flights. So we added this last two, and what happens is, the instructor under training, or student instructor, goes in, runs the whole event, and you have the instructor there who really just kind of checks him. Gary Nettie, he can run the event or he can't run the event. Um, and really it's kind of, uh, we did some kind of uh, check or assessment thing, and really that kind of solidified everything we were training to make sure they got it. So that's kind of how we designed it. And uh, I don't want to make out blush here, but uh, whenever <laughs> it talks about the H65C IET syllabus, well, he did that last year. He did that uh, during the last summer. He's the one that conducted the analysis and defined the whole core tax. And uh, Mary, we were talking earlier about how, how do you save money whenever you're developing the, the instruction regarding these. Well, I was able to take uh, these works, uh, what the, the work that he did with these tasks for a totally different simulated, and I was able to take those same tasks and roll them into these same tasks here and develop a whole new instruction and even, and even build upon it. Uh, based upon the, the, the framework that he, he, he did. The task transferred perfectly, which saved a huge amount of time in analysis and development. Uh, so, any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, Al, how does it work when, because uh, uh, especially in those last two check rides, you have students in there who are being checked, you have an instructor who's being checked. What happens if you, know, you, you have an instructor who may not be quite there yet? Is it just a, you know, at the moment feedback from the, the actual instructor who's sitting there checking? Yeah. Because you, you, have, you have a yeah. double scenario there. It's yeah, like exactly. looking into a mirror back into a mirror. And it's yeah. What we found uh, in Ops and, and using this and, and, and right there, what we found is when we did the practice events, we really worked out the kinks, and by the time they got to the assessment, the other the other guy, the, the true instructor, didn't really have to say anything. We, we had done enough analysis and figured out what they needed to know and be able to do that it didn't get weird. And, okay. uh, and if they needed to step in, they did. But it, we found that the instructor could pretty much run the event um, like that. Could get it up on motion and everything. I didn't so. know if you, you, know, you, you specifically went towards you know, more advanced students, the actual students in there, and to, to do the check ride with the IP or not, or you know, I just... I don't understand your question. Uh, yeah, if you, if, like more advanced student pilots who are up in the cockpit, if you use, you know, the more experienced training. guys up there, that oh, way did you have we, a younger... did we change the students to... Yeah, it didn't, no. No, it didn't fit, no. it just didn't matter. No, because the reason, the reason we didn't want to do that is because we needed to make sure they could... Do it at any time. That's right. And, and what we found, and you would know this, that those events are really peak course events. Yeah. And we focused on the peak pr uh, proficiency course events. That's... Proficiency courses when qualified pilots come back to ATC Mobile and they do refresher. We we didn't want to put them in the the transition course, which is the new pilots, because that the level of student knowledge and what they're interacting with. The the graduate school of an instructor pilot is running a running a instructor event, and the guys that are instructors know this. And you have people up front that have five thousand hours, and you've got to have your act together. You know what I mean? And uh, so we found that when we assessed at that level, that actually really kind of answers your question. We assessed at the P course level. Yeah, and right, that's yeah. what happened. This is something, and again, having been there, that is something we've needed for a long time, is, is what you guys Yeah, the branches are embracing it, and our next move is to do the fixed wing folks. So this is what the pilots, the instructor pilots, had to say about the instructor pilot training. What I like about the uh, new IUT syllabus is that we get the chance to have the IUT in with the IP, just a one-on-one -on -one session. He gets to go over all the, the functions, basically all the functions of the iOS, and uh, uh, all they have to get later on is the timing of the event, like the student event, are they doing it too uh, fast, are they not taking enough time? But honestly, the uh, guys that are here for their last year, that have been here already three years, starting their fourth year here, uh, can't do things on the iOS. They haven't even seen things on the iOS that our new uh, instructors are seeing right now. So it's it's very beneficial, and like I said, that one-on-one -on -one time is, is what it takes. He was talking about that first session where it's just the instructor pilot with the instructor.
the new of t instructor syllabus has been outstanding for us uh, many times when i'm in, inside the sim teaching uh, new uh, instructors uh, many times they point out things that i've ever, that i've never seen before three years ago when i, I went through the uh, the iut um, we didn't have we weren't taught how to use the oft so i had to basically pretty much teach myself um, and uh, when, once I got into the sim without a uh, instructor in there, when I was by myself, I felt like I was really, really behind the, uh, the simulator and I was playing catch up. I had to figure out where this button was, where that button was. But it seems like now, with the new IUTs, when they come through, when I instruct them, that they're well ahead of the aircraft. They're definitely well ahead of where I was three years ago. And even now, to this day, they, um, they actually point out things that I hadn't learned yet. So they'll show me some different buttons and different switches that are new to me. And then our, our final testimony is... Uh... Parts that are good about um, having a one system by still on how to use all the equipment that we have here is one, the information is not lost, and two, it gets passed down correctly from person to person. Um, the, the, what we found really beneficial is, is one, when the, when the new pilots come in here, they're given, because before they were never given a time dedicated to them with, a, with another instructor to say this is how this works, this is what you do. Um, it was really, it was always based upon going in with a, two students that were here for some type of training. And the hard part about that is your focus is on the students, not necessarily focusing on the instructor who's learning how to run the simulator. So what, I, what we've liked about it is it, one, it dedicates that time to the time of schedule and that it's not lost. And two, He's got a reference that that instructor pilot, instructor pilot can use in front of him that walks him through each aspect, how to do all the tasks, and uh, really has a better idea of how to how to run the sim, how to make it, um, how to how to change the weather, how to reload the system, how to put it up on motion. So those are not lessons learned with students. They're lessons learned by themselves in a really in a non critical environment. The good part about breaking the tasks down is it allows, uh, it allows the instructor a little bit more freedom to develop more full scenario, more realistic scenario. So the focus, now that I understand how to create different aspects, different aspects within the sim, I didn't have to focus on creating it. I could, I could focus on um, creating a, a simulated environment in which each one of those little tasks that I learned how to do earlier, I could take each one of those tasks and bring it into the, I could bring it into the environment uh, to better create you create really better situational awareness for the two pilots up front. Okay, lights please. Okay, so the takeaway on this is it's about the simulated environment and it's about, it's not about the toy, it's about the what? Yeah. Yeah. Alright, thank you very much. Appreciate you.